hear me all right? I'm going to wander around a bit. I've, I've got to advance this and at the same time show you the video. It's, um, any way to make this? You can't make this any darker, I imagine. Um, it is what it is. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's, uh, it's great to get out of New Bedford and give a talk. Uh, I haven't been to this campus before. I've done a little bit of work in the Grafton Cam North Grafton camp campus years and years ago because of our stress work. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk at all about our stress physiology. Um, it can be stressful to do the stress work on a big shark, um, but it's, uh, at the same time, it's kind of cutting edge stuff and it's pretty exciting. Um, today, I'm going to center my talk really on the, uh, the, the ecological work we're doing with white sharks. I'm sure you've all heard the stories of white sharks on Cape Cod. Anyone get out there and see them? Has anyone gone out and seen them? You have? Yeah. Anyone get out to the Cape and, and, and hear the stories of the white sharks? Uh, I'm going to tell that story, give you a little bit of historical perspective, and, um, and then tell you uh, what we're doing nowadays with trying to study the ecology. And I think the most fascinating part of the talk is going to be how technology has changed, and the tools that we're using have changed dramatically since I uh, was your age. So um, give you a quick outline. Uh, I'll go over the historical, what we've known historically based on data, collected uh, about the natural history. I'll talk about seal populations and how they've changed and how that has really opened the door to what we're doing right now. And then I'm going to jump right into the movement ecology work we're doing and, and, uh, and touch on acoustic technology, which has been around for many, many years, but has evolved dramatically to give us long-term local tracking data, satellite-based technology, a couple different technologies that we're using to track these animals uh, using archival tags as well as real-time satellite tracking, and then I'll end with some autonomous vehicle tracking that we've done over the last couple of years that uh, I think has tremendous potential down the road. Um, right now we're just taking baby steps with that research, but we're finding things out. Um, when we look at the biology of the great white shark in the North Atlantic, in particular the Western North Atlantic, there's not a lot that has been published relative to the natural history of this animal. We have basic distribution data, which I will go over in the next slide. We have some bunch of physiological work done by a, a, a great physiologist out of Woods Hole back in the uh, 70s and 80s, Frank Carey. And we have a, a smattering of life history information, most of which has come from dead animals. Um, in terms of population assessment, we've done some modeling in recent years that shows that the population of white sharks on the east coast of the U.S. had been decimated uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, 1960s, 70s, into the 80s, but protections are now allowing that population to respond. So we're seeing a rebounding population, but in terms of movement ecology, we don't have a lot. That's not to say that this hasn't been done in other parts of the world. There, and, and I'll talk about some of the research done elsewhere using the same state-of-the-art technology that we're using now. And of course, they've been able to do it for a much longer period of time. Um, when we look at the distribution in the Western North Atlantic, most of what we know about that comes from interactions with fishing gear. So each one of these little green dots, which number over uh, 600, dating back to the early 1800s, has been, a, you know, we've compiled these data uh, and published a paper just a couple of years ago talking about trends in the population based on these data, but this is all what we call fisheries dependent data. This is basically a fisherman out fishing, catches a white shark, most of the time inadvertently. They're targeting some other species. White shark swims into a gill net. They report that. It ends up as a green dot on the map. And when you can see, we can get a nice handle on the distribution of this animal, but it also tells us where fishermen are fishing. So it might not necessarily tell us where the sharks are actually going in three-dimensional space. And it really doesn't tell us much about the ecology of the animal, how it lives, how it interacts with its environment. Um, but each one of these little green dots sometimes comes to shore. So we can get specimens from these green dots. And sometimes, particularly back in the 80s, prior to the shark, be this particular species being protected by the US and state governments, fishermen would bring these sharks in to show off, to also um, take the jaws out, you know, in some cases to eat them. So w over the years, back when I was working uh, at the Narragansett Laboratory of the National Marine Fisheries Service, we would see some of these little green dots, and they were really small. This is about the size a uh, white shark is born, and then we'd sometimes get to see really big ones as well. This is one that was harpooned by a fisherman off Montauk in the early 80s. 
And what you, we would do, and, and I'm, a, I'm a classically trained fisheries biologist, which means that most of what I did in the early part of my career was based on dead fish. You know, I cut up a lot of dead fish, and I cut up a lot of dead sharks, and sometimes I would go out and kill sharks in order to cut them up. And what do we learn from cutting fish up? We can learn about its feeding ecology. We can learn about its growth rate by looking at rings in the vertebrae. We can look at about its reproductive status, mature, immature. We can look at the fecundity, those all aspects of its reproduction. We can take tissue samples relative to its physiology. So there's a lot you can actually learn from a dead fish. And most of what we know about the life history of this animal has come from sampling these kinds of specimens. Not that there were a lot of them. I mean, even though there's over 600 green dots, think of the time period that that spans, you know, literally over 100 years. So white shark has always been fairly elusive. We haven't learned a lot about its ecology because it's been really hard for scientists to go out and find white sharks in the Western Atlantic Ocean. Um, a pioneering study, and I already mentioned Frank Carey's name, was done in the 19, late 1970s and published in the early 80s by Frank Carey and his colleagues. Frank was a pioneer in building acoustic tags to put on sharks. He was really the one, I mean, you couldn't buy, the, now you can buy these tags off the shelf. But he, in his lab in Woods Hole, he would actually build these tags. And what these tags do is they emit, emit a very high frequency ping. You could put all kinds of sensors on the tags and those pings would be translated to depth or to temperature. And what he would do is build these and put them on fish and follow the fish to see, see what they were doing in three-dimensional space. So he's the first person to ever do this on sharks and tunas. And he did one particular track on a white shark that was feeding on a whale carcass south of Montauk, New York. And he followed it for almost three days. And he published this paper. And in this paper, he talks about the three-dimensional movements of this animal. And it was a, really a landmark paper because no one had really done this before. And you could see the movements of the animal in three-dimensional space. So this is the depth of the shark relative to the thermocline. And what he said is, he concluded is that these sharks, these white sharks, we don't see a lot of them in the Atlantic. Uh, but when they, what we do know about them based on this one little track that spanned just a snapshot of this animal's life is that they hang most of the time in the water column uh, around the thermocline, in the thermocline. But they make these occasional dives to the bottom. And because this shark was feeding on a whale carcass and because seal populations had been decimated in the North Atlantic by the, the 1980s, um, he, he hypothesized that white sharks are elusive because they wander around the Atlantic and they dive to the, the bottom, they follow these scent trails and they're looking for food and they're feeding on or near the bottom occasionally, but also in the thermocline. We don't have seal populations to aggregate them as we do in other parts of the world. And this, I just want to throw this up there, just a simple Google Earth image showing his track. And I want you to put this, file this in the back of your mind, because I'm going to show you how far we've come with newer technologies since that landmark paper in, in 1982. Um, but I've mentioned these global hotspots for white sharks where scientists and filmmakers and divers uh, have been working with white sharks literally for decades. And these hotspots exists uh, off the coast of California, South Africa, South Australia, and, and Guadalupe Island in Mexico. And I've been to a few of these hot spots, and believe me, if you, like, if, if you have a whole bunch of money and you want to go spend it and dive with white sharks, this is where you go. And if you want to make films about white sharks, this is where you go. And if you want to study white sharks, this is where you go. And what, what is it that these hot spots have in common? And that is food that looks like this. All right? If you've got massive seal colonies that, that form up different times of the year, and that, those seal colonies overlap with the distribution of the white shark, the white shark figures that out. And the white shark, which is a top predator in the ocean that targets pinnipeds, will go to those areas seasonally. And that's exactly what happens in these global hotspots. You've got these massive cafes that have opened for white sharks. White sharks are one of the few species of animals that will attack and kill pinnipeds. And white sharks go to these areas to do just that. So remember what Frank Carey said, we can't find white sharks in the Atlantic because we don't have big seal colonies like we used to historically. Now, did we have seal colonies historically? And the answer is yes. This is a, a thesis dissertation actually written by Stephanie Wood in 2009. She went to UMass Boston, and one of her chapters looks at the history of the gray seal. The gray seal. And the gray seal is a big seal. It gets to be, you know, five, six hundred pounds, seven, eight feet long. So it's one of the larger seals, one of the largest seals we have in the eastern United States. Um, 
What we've got here is a map from her thesis that basically indicates, you'll see a bunch of uh, crosses or, or plus signs on it. Those are archaeological sites that indicate that the gray seal was once really, really quite abundant off the northeastern US and Canada. And its populations had been decimated in actuality by the end of the 17th century. So we really hit these animals pretty hard for food, for clothing, and we kept them depressed, their populations depressed, to the point where the population that existed in the, in the 1970s, the remnant population was only about 10,000 gray seals on a tiny little island off the coast of Nova Scotia called Sable Island, which was the only remaining seal colony. And as a result, the population had been decimated. There were no breeding colonies anywhere in the US or mainland Canada left. But in 1972, we passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which was landmark legislation. And of course, with that level of protection that came to all marine mammals, including pinnipeds, and because it's a marine mammal and it reproduces incredibly slowly, as all, many mammals do, it's taken a long time for these populations to come back. So this is the largest breeding colony in the US, and it's on a tiny little island between Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard called Muskegon Island. And what we've seen over the years is this is the number of pups born on Muskegon Island since 1991. And you can see that just a handful of pups were born in 91, and over 2,000 were born uh, in 2008. So it gives us a real sense of the relative increase in this population that has occurred in the northeastern US. And now we have resident reproducing colonies right here in Cape Cod. And when you open this restaurant, what's going to show up? And that is called luck, because I happen to be in the right place at the right time doing shark research and a number of other uh, species of tunas and such. And along come the, these white sharks back to this cape to start uh, feeding on these seals. And here's some uh, imagery of what we've captured over the years of predation events. This shot by my spotter pilot. I'll show you more of his work shortly. This one uh, uh, shot by a, somebody out for a picnic lunch on Monomoy Island. And that is the remnant of a, a, a carcass that had washed ashore, clearly signs of predation by white sharks. So now we've got predictable, for the very first time in many, many years, probably historically, we have predictable access to white sharks for scientists. We have our own little hot spot forming. And as a result, we've been able to go from uh, uh, Frank Carey's pioneering acoustic track in 1979 up to tagging 80 animals over the course of the last six years. So we've dramatically increased the numbers that we've tagged over a fairly, you know, a very broad size range representing really the size range of the species with a variety of newer technologies. You know, acoustic tags building on Frank Carey's early work uh, pop-up satellite tags, which archive data and come off the animal, as well as real-time satellite tags, which allow you, me, and the general public to follow our sharks online in almost real time. So I'm going to walk through these technologies and what we've learned from them. And I'll go through our tagging technique first. And we use a very unique tagging technique. Most of the time, if you hear about people who, in the, I, I do this with a lot of other shark species because they're, it's the easiest way to tag them. You know, we take a boat out, we put a bunch of chum in the water, sharks swim up to the boat, and we either catch them, bring them on the boat and tag them, or we tag them while they're swimming past the boat, depending on their size. You know, if the shark gets up over eight, nine feet in length, I typically don't like to bring it on my boat. <laughs> um, that doesn't work with our white sharks um, off of Cape Cod. White sharks off Cape Cod have piles and piles of seals lining the beaches, so they're not particularly interested in anything I throw in the water to attract them. So as a result, since we can't go, since they can't come to us or don't come to us, we go to them. So I've got a very specialized vessel with a pulpit, which is the long pointed nose on this, on this vessel. It's fast. It goes, uh, it's got twin outboards and it moves very, very quickly. It's got a tower so we can find the sharks. And I hire a pilot to locate the sharks. So in essence, what we do is we go out to where the sharks are and we sneak up on them. And for every shark that we come up upon, we videotape it. And basically what we're doing is, is fingerprinting it. By videotaping the shark, we get a sense of exactly who it is because every single white shark is unique in terms of coloration, scarring patterns, and fin shapes. So we're able to actually mark them visually by videotaping them. And of course, what do we use? We use a GoPro, right? We use a little GoPro camera. GoPros, you know, didn't exist when I was your age. We, we would have had to throw a cameraman in the water holding a giant camera system and hold them by the feet, and that wouldn't have worked all that well. 
Um, so now we use these little GoPro cameras, and they're really, really good at documenting these animals. And we also, once we've video documented that animal, we then will place a tag at the base of its dorsal fin um, using an intramuscular dart, the same dart that's been used for, for many, many years on a variety of shark species. Um, and so what, we, what we've been doing with this, this video documentation is we've been able to compile data on um, numbers of individual animals. And so the biggest question that I get from a lot of people is how many white sharks are out there, right? Uh, particularly people who live on Cape Cod, right? So uh, in 2015, we actually tabulated 141 individual sharks, right? 100 of those were new, 100 sharks we, we had not seen before. And what we're doing with these data is a traditional mark recapture study to model the population size. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I've got a PhD student who's working on it. Uh, I'd rather move on and tell you about the, the ecological work we're doing with the tags. But just to give you a sense of, of, uh, of how we're going out there and seeing these sharks. And here's, here's a great shot by my spotter pilot. It's, of course, it's not dark enough in the room, but there's actually four sharks in this photo. And on, um, on our best day, we've seen as many as 26 white sharks in a single day. Um, and it's a very methodical survey. We go out twice a week from mid-June through October, uh, cover the same ground, and have standardized our sampling, which is important for the mark recapture work. So before I dive into the data we're getting from the tags, I want to give you some of the visuals that we've seen over just in 2015. And a lot of these are captured by my spotter pilot, Wayne Davis, including a, a predation on a seal that occurred about a half a mile from shore uh, with the shark following the seal, waiting it for it to bleed to death before it eats it. And that's the typical technique that these sharks use. They attack the seal with speed, with stealth. They render a fairly sizable wound. They hope the seal will bleed to death, so they will eat it. The shark does not risk its own health by consuming the seal because the seal is going to fight back, and the seal has teeth and it has claws. And we do see quite a few sharks with scratch marks and wounds from seals. This is a seasoned veteran, this particular shark, waiting for this seal to, uh, to bleed to death. Um, this is an interesting sequence, and it actually got quite a bit of, of attention when we shot it. So here we have um, one of the things that occurs. The seals are adapting to the presence of the sharks. And the way they do that is as the sharks start to show up in large numbers in July, August, and September, the seals stay very, very, very close to shore. They're not stupid. Except every now and then, one of the younger seals will be stupid. And when the younger seal is stupid, the shark figures that out. So here's this shark that's patrolling in only about 12 feet of water. These seals are staying in about four to six feet of water or shallower. They're older, they're, they're wiser seals. I'm sitting on the pulpit of the boat holding a GoPro camera. When this seal wanders out from underneath me, to where the shark is. And my spotter pilot, Wayne, captured this, these two shots. This one, uh, the last one, and then this one of the shark actually accelerating and attacking, trying to attack the seal. And hopefully this will show, but I will, um, I'll show you the video that I shot of that event. And it'll happen twice. The first one will be in, in, re in, re in real time. And you notice, now this will be in slow motion. And you'll notice the shark misses. You see the seal come out of the water. Shark go up after it and miss. The seal shot right up onto the beach and never went in the water again. <laughs> but these are just some of the kinds of observations we get looking at the predatory behavior of these animals. This, I love this photo. There's a windsurfer who had no clue that this particular shark was there. And of course, nothing happened to the windsurfer. Nothing happened to the windsurfer. Um, we later showed the windsurfer, and he's not windsurfing again, um, in that area at least. So uh, the technology developed by Frank Carey, uh, or used by Frank Carey on big fish like sharks, was active acoustic telemetry, where he puts a transmitter on the shark, a hydrophone in the water that's wired up to a receiver on the boat, and he physically follows the shark collecting data, recreating its movements. That's great technology, except for the fact that nobody can do that more than four or five days before running out of gas, getting into bad weather, running out of food, or killing each other. These kinds of things happen when you listen to a pinging from a, an acoustic tag. Um, so the technology has evolved, though. 
um, to what we call passive acoustic telemetry, where you put transmitters on sharks and then they transmit for multiple years and then you wire the area with receivers. It's a great way to look at habitat use, site fidelity, residency in specific areas. So it's a wonderful technology that we're using to look at where the sharks spend their time around the Cape. So I've got all these receivers and I'll show you the, the array we've got set up now and how we're going to increase it. Um, but we get a sense of whether the sharks are spending all their time around the seal colony, around the surfing beach, the swimming beach, another seal colony, in the harbor, all those kinds of things. And towns now are buying receivers and deploying them for us because they want to know whether white sharks are coming to them. So it's, it's, uh, it gives you a nice sense of where the sharks are spending their time. And then you can also look at the data, stratify it relative to time of day, tide, other environmental variables to look if there's any patterns of residency in these specific areas. So you can go, you can, it's really wonderful data sets that they generate. Now, if your shark does not stay in the area, you don't hear from it again. It just moves on. And you're better off using a satellite-based technology. Um, this is a, a shark, uh, a great example of a shark that we've tagged with acoustic technology. Her name is Julia. She was tagged in 2011. And um, you see the spotter plane up there. I will just take the GoPro camera and jam it into the water. Uh, but the shark is between us and the beach. So as you can see, this is just raw footage. It's not all that refined. But I want to give, give you a sense of what these animals look like when they're in this shallow water. The, who's, any scuba divers here? Anybody who spends time around New England ocean water? You know how beautifully crystal clear it is? <laughs> That's New England coastal water. <laughs> um, pea soup, if you will. Um, and for you divers, if, you know, if you do dive, you'll realize that fairly quickly that the best place to dive is not New England unless you get way up in north, northern New England. Um, so here's Julia swimming around, and you'll see as I get up on her uh, right side, her acoustic tag right there. These tags will last up to 10 years. So we'll get a sense of not only where Julia spends her time, but when she leaves the area, and then the following year when she comes back. So what's really fascinating about this particular large female is she comes back at least three years in a row, she's come back on Memorial Day weekend, which, which is really quite fast. I mean, that's almost publishable, publishable in and of itself. I mean, in Cape Cod Magazine, perhaps. But um, really fascinating that she has remarkable timing, comes back to this area um, that same weekend every year. Now, what's also fascinating is we've learned that from the, the 65 sharks we've tagged with this technology, that um, most of them are just transient visitors. They don't spend their time uh, in the Cape region. They actually more like traveling on I-95 someplace else and pulling off into McDonald's rest stop, right? And fueling up and then getting back on the highway and keep going. And we think they end up in the Gulf of Maine to where there's much higher uh, densities of seals. But that, this, is, this is the kind of data this technology gives you. So some of our 2015 results these are the white sharks. We tagged 24 more sharks with this technology. This is where we've tagged the sharks. And you can see, uh, for the most part, this is our hot spot. This is an area that is mostly National Wildlife Refuge. It is inhabited by high densities of seals. Not a lot of people go down to this area. It's largely off limits to people, so the seals are not disturbed. There's relatively uh, deep water close to shore where the sharks can get in there, so it's an ideal place for these animals to be hunting. One of the things we're seeing is uh, their, their range extend further north to other seal colonies that are uh, in areas sometimes where there's lots of people. Um, and this is what our acoustic receiver array looks like. There's one of our acoustic receivers right there. It's only about that big. It's a relatively inexpensive technology. You know, these tags are only about $400, and the acoustic receivers themselves are only about $1,500. So that's actually cheap in the world of tagging technology. And you can see what our, uh, our receivers look like. This is what our receiver arrays look like. Now, this technology is not only being used to study white sharks. We're using it to look at striped bass movements. This particular concentration of receivers is looking at a, a, a very, very important cod spawning habitat. So we've got a number of different species tagged throughout Massachusetts with the technology. And any time they pick up a white shark, they will also log the white sharks in addition to those other species. 
And if we look at our 31,000 acoustic detections we had in the summer of 2015, we could simp do a simple plot, and you could see that the bulk of the sharks were here in August, September, and October, and they disappear in December. So we get a sense of the seasonality of these animals. And you can look at the red line and get the number of sharks as well. So you get detections and sharks, and you can do some very, very simple analyses to look at seasonality. Then you look at where these sharks were detected. So these are the receivers on which the sharks were detected. The folks in Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound, Nantucket Sound, were really surprised by this, as were the folks in Wellfleet, where we had detections from five individual white sharks in 2015. Um, we could stratify these data further, and I could plot them out by town. So we could see, look at the seasonality of detections in each town, talk to the towns about that. Some of these towns have very popular swimming beaches, others do not. And then we could take the data further, as I said, into modeling uh, seasonal patterns uh, relative to other variables. So it's really a wonderful way to get a, a long-term data set on individual sharks. If you want to look at broader scale movements of these animals, we kind of swap over to satellite-based tagging to get a real good sense of the broad scale movements and look at habitat associations and seasonality and timing and such. And the most popular used on fish these days is called the pop-up satellite tag. This is actually an older generation of this tag. But think of it as a data logger. It collects temperature, depth, and light levels. And it just stores those data, but it's got a clock built into it. And when you put this tag on an animal, that clock starts ticking, and then you set the, the date, the time, that it will detach, and it will. It'll detach from that animal, float to the surface, and then transmit those archived data to a satellite, which then relays them to you. So you do a retrospective analysis on where the shark went after you tagged it. And it's been used on everything from swordfish to bluefin tuna to uh, a, a number of shark species, a number of shark species. And most of what we know about the broad scale movements of these animals comes from PSAT tags, pop-up satellite tags. These are expensive. These are about $4,500 each. So once you start graduating up to satellite-based technology, you start getting into the deep pocket arena. Um, People ask me all the time, well, why don't you just use real-time satellite tags that we could put on turtles and seals and some uh, cetacean species? And it's largely because fish don't have to breathe air. So fish, you may put a, one of those real-time satellite tags on a, on a shark, and it may stay on the bottom its entire life. It doesn't have to come to the surface, in which case you will not hear from it again. However, that technology does exist. And there are some uh, fin-mounted tags that we have used on five white sharks. Here they are right here. This is an accelerometer, which I will not talk about today, but gives us really fine scale, high resolution data. And this is a satellite transmitter right there. Um, the technique for, ta remember I told you, you don't really want to bring a really big shark up onto your boat unless you have the right boat. And the, the folks that we've worked with over the years is a group called OSEARCH. They're a nonprofit that has a lift system for bringing very large animals out of the water, giving us access to tagging them with this technology. And the reason we need that access is because the, the tag has to be mounted at the top of the dorsal fin. And you've got to bolt it there, nylon bolt, surgical grade, put it there, and uh, that'll last for three to five years. And what that allows is any time that shark comes to the surface, if it comes to the surface, it will transmit to a satellite, satellite will relay it to us, and we can get that online almost immediately. And again, it gives you really great geopositioning estimates where that shark is, Doppler-based, and it also lets you model where these animals go, the movements, the habitat preferences, and such. But you do need the right vessel to do that. There are folks who will catch really large sharks and bring them up against the side of their boat, but what happens is that shark will typically beat itself against the boat, and you do a lot of damage to the animal. And, uh, and, and the one thing, if you're, if you're studying the behavior of an animal, you don't want to mess with it too much, because you really want natural behavior. Um, so I'll give you a, a short video of the tagging of one of these sharks. It goes fairly quickly, but it gives you a sense of how we go about using this particular system, the lift system on the O-Surge vessel. So this is Mary Lee. Mary Lee's going to be caught on a very large circle hook. She'll be baited, caught on a large circle hook about the size of my arm so she doesn't swallow it. She'll be hooked in the, in the corner of her jaw, and she'll be basically walked like a large dog over to this platform. And once she's close to the platform, uh, Brett, Brett will, uh, will jump in the water and guide the line onto the platform, and then these guys will make sure that she gets onto the platform. Once she's onto it, that platform will come out of the water, 
and then her gills will be irrigated immediately so she's breathing, and her eyes will be covered. So she'll lay perfectly still uh, while, while that happens, and then what we'll do is we'll hop on board and put up to five different kinds of tagging technologies on her or in her. We'll take blood for stress physiology. We'll do parasite and tissue samples for a variety of other studies. And we do all that in about 15 minutes as she's let go and, uh, and then swims on her way. So to give you, now remember, what I want you to do is go back to that image I gave you of Frank Carey's track, all right? And I want you to jump up to where we are now. These are a combination of our pop-up satellite tags and our spot tags, uh, which are the smart positioning tags we use with the O-Search. You can go to the O-Search website, by the way, and see where the sharks are if they surface. Two of our sharks do not spend a lot of time at the surface, so it looks like they fly over Florida back and forth because there's no dots that show them going around it. Um, and that's them here. <laughs> um, so here you can see how we've exploded the tech, how the technology really has exploded what we've learned about these animals when we combine the various technologies. Now we can take these data sets and stratify, stratify them certainly by time of year, uh, season, whatever you want to do, individuals, and we can start modeling their habitat use and their behavioral movement patterns. So our preliminary analyses of that, and I've got another student working on that, um, kind of interesting, we see two general patterns emerge, and I almost, I'm afraid to call them two general patterns. Um, but one of them is best exhibited by a shark named Catherine. And this is a very simple north-south migratory pattern. I, I, I sometimes call it my snowbird migratory pattern. It's when you go from Cape Cod to Florida uh, from the summer to the winter, and then you come back to Cape Cod the following year. And it's a very coastal migration. The sharks are very oriented to near shore areas, coastal areas, and the continental shelf, and they move north and south, north and south. Um, Catherine is a great example of our coastal migratory pattern, and here you can see her movements around Cape Cod from the satellite tracking data where she's not only hanging out off Monomoy and the elbow of the Cape, but heading up into Cape Cod Bay and Wellfleet and those other areas where you've seen the detection data. Um, the opposite end of the spectrum is best represented by a shark named Lydia. And, Lydia uh, actually does not spend much time at all on the continental shelf and spends most of her time wandering about the Atlantic. Very, very, very different movements. Working her way all the way out to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, working north and south on the ridge, coming back toward the coast, but an oceanic uh, lifestyle that's very, very different from our coastal sharks. Now, the big question for us is why? And if we look at the depth data from these two sharks, we can see that on the left, our, our coastal shark, Catherine, is really spending the bulk of her time in shallow water. She's on the shelf. She's restricting herself to the shelf. The time she wanders off the shelf is she's off a of Hatteras, where the shelf is very, very thin, Cape Hatteras, and then she dives down a little bit uh, in November, but then spends the bulk of her time up on the shelf. And this is the depth uh, of the top, and this is the proportion of time spent at those depths. These brighter colors indicate that she's spending a lot of time at those depths, but this is only 25 meters deep. The opposite end of the spectrum is, again, Lydia, an oceanic lifestyle. While she's on the shelf, the early part of her track, she's only going down to about 25 meters deep, again, very shallow, but when she leaves the shelf, she's penetrating depths as great as 1,000 meters. So she's doing this almost every day. And these bright colors here tells me that she's spending a high proportion of her time in that depth range, and that's that depth range is three to 400 meters. So that means that the animal's specifically going down to a depth to do something. It's spending a tremendous amount of energy, and of course there's always trade-offs with energy. You're gonna go, you know, you're gonna walk across town to get a meal, or you're gonna go across the street. You know, there's trade-offs, there's always trade-offs. It's gotta be worth it to go across town, right? Maybe they have a good band that night, maybe they got a good beer special, or maybe that's just the food is much, much better than the joint across the street, but it's gotta be worth it to you to go there. In the case of the sharks, you've got a Lydia that's wandering around the Atlantic, diving down to depths as great as 1,000 meters to a very, very broad temperature range. You can see up at the top there, very broad temperature range um, from 5 degrees uh, at the bottom or near the, or at, at depth up to about uh, uh, I got a 28, 20 degrees. So it's pretty, 28 degrees, it's pretty warm at the surface, which means she's associated with the Gulf Stream there. So the big question for us is, is why? Why do you have these two patterns? Why not just act like Catherine, go up and down the coastline, you're gonna find plenty to eat because Catherine's surviving, she's doing quite well. 
Why wander out into the Atlantic? Is it driven by reproduction? Is it driven by feeding ecology? What is going on? And nobody can answer the question. So they found some very interesting things in the Pacific Ocean. Some of you may have heard of what's called the White Shark Cafe. Now the timing in the Pacific is much, much tighter. Almost all the sharks they tag off the coast of California go out to this place called the White Shark Cafe in the off months. And they dive down to depths not as great as this, but down to four, five, six hundred meters every day. And one school of thought is that uh, one lab thinks that they're, they're, they're going out there to reproduce. It's not driven by food. The other lab believes that's absolutely bull. It, no one's going to go to a place the size of Texas to try to find a mate spread out over a giant area when you're all piled up on the shoreline eating seals right then and there. Um, so there's great debate over what's going on. Is it driven by food or reproduction? And it's really, really hard question to answer. So a couple of years ago, I was talking with my colleagues at Woods Hole and uh, just my friends at Discovery Channel, because I needed somebody to pay for this, um, <laughs> Uh, about drone technology. You know, can we follow an animal without having to hire a ship and a submersible and find a needle in a haystack? Can we, can we use some kind of underwater vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, to follow an animal when it wanders out into these areas? And the answer I got from my friends at Woods Hole is you're out of your mind, it's not going to work. But after uh, a lot of discussion and realizing that uh, these vehicles respond quite well uh, communicating underwater with something called the transponder, and that we could actually put the transponder on the shark, because these sharks are big, maybe we can get the vehicle to actually follow the shark. And not only follow it and collect environmental data while it's doing that, but also uh, image it and get actual observations of what it is doing. Now that's a really a giant step, and no one's ever done that before. Um, but, you know, giant steps start with baby steps. So with funding from Discovery and uh, working closely with the Oceanographic Systems Lab, uh, we started doing some tiny trials in 2012 looking, uh, using a smaller autonomous vehicle called the, the Remus 100. Hui calls all their vehicles Remus units, so it's their, their brand name. Um, and we modified the vehicle with GoPros to accommodate our friends at Discovery. And, um, and we modified the transponder too. So this is the communication device that the scientists use to, to go back and forth with the AUV. And you've got to think of it in terms of just a, a very sophisticated game of, of, of Marco Polo. All right? Who's played that game before? You're in a pool, you're blindfolded. Of course, we all cheat. <laughs> Everybody cheats when they play Marco Polo. Who can see, right? Um, but think of it this way, basically the AUV is, is, is using an underwater modem system, and I'm really simplifying this, but it, it, uh, it screams out Marco and the transponder goes polo, all right? And they do this over the course of the track, and they do it every three or four seconds. And the AUV has to make a number of decisions based on the projected path of the animal so it can catch up with it. And it's really quite sophisticated programming that has gone into this, and all of it's been done by my colleagues at Woods Hole. So we did a number of trials, including off of Cape Cod, and my, my favorite shark that we worked with on Cape Cod was Large March, and it was a fairly sizable female um, white shark that was hanging out off Cape Cod. And these are the first tracks that we ever did, uh, not using a boat like Frank Carey did, but by putting a robot in the water to follow these sharks. Um, and it was a giant step forward, even though it was just a baby step in terms of where we want to go with the technology, but these are tracks generated by the AUV, the drone, while it's following the fish. And we got some great underwater imagery as well, which made Discovery Channel, of course, very happy, uh, as well as the, the journal editors and such. So we, we, uh, this is Large Marge with the transponder. Um, Discovery loved the, where we went with it uh, so much that they paid for us to go and take it to the next level, and, uh, and, and that was at Guadalupe Island. Guadalupe Island is a wonderful island where you can dive with white sharks, crystal clear water, um, but very, very deep water. So what we want to do is do longer tracks and deeper tracks to follow these animals using AUV technology. And so we mod modified the technology, and most of it went into algorithms, changing the algorithms. Um, and we did generate some interesting tracks. These are two sharks that we tracked in 2013. Um, and we didn't do it, the AUV did. We just sat on our anchor while the, uh, while the vehicle followed the sharks. 
And the big mystery around, about white sharks around Guadalupe Island has been um, what do they eat when they're there? Now we know that the shoreline is piled up with Guadalupe fur seals and uh, northern elephant seals. But my colleague, my Mexican colleague, Mauricio Hoyos, has said to me over the years, we know there are seals, we know there are sharks, but we've never seen the sharks eat the seals. So he's hypothesized that the water is so clear that these sharks are probably feeding at greater depths. They're waiting for the seals to come and go from the island, and they're staying down deep, hunkering down in very, very dark water, waiting for the seals to come up overhead and the silhouette and then attack them. But he couldn't prove it because he couldn't follow the sharks into deep water. Well, we were able to do that. We did six different tracks while we were there. And this is to I'll show you two of the tracks. One of the sharks is deep blue. And here you can see the AUV mirroring beautifully in three-dimensional space the movements of deep blue when it was in shallow water. And I don't know how, how well this video is going to show in this room, but I'll give you a little bit of the video shot by uh, this. And you should be able to see, well, maybe not. Uh, well, yeah, it's not dark enough. I'm sorry. But the shark is actually in the center frame. So, yeah, you, and actually what you'd see here in a darker room is the bottom. And you'll see the shark and the AUV approaching the shark in this clear water. And the shark is down around 100 meters deep. All right, so the sharks we found were spending a tremendous amount of time at depth, even though most people thought they were spending all their time in, in shallower water. And I think the one thing um, that surprised us is some of the interactions we saw. Um, but here's the shark with the transponder, which we get back. We just send a signal to the transponder. It pops off. Um, and there you can see the bottom and the shark. Um, so not only could we do the kind of plots that Frank Carey was doing relative to behavior, but we could actually see what the shark was doing. And what you see here and this will be the end of it, I'll let you guys go, um, is a view, again, from the vehicle at that point time in, when uh, the shark was actually down about 150 meters deep. But the vehicle, had to, because it's restricted to 100 meters, could not go down to the shark. The shark actually came to the vehicle. <laughs> Hence, we tested Mauricio's hypothesis. <laughs> Will sharks attack at depth? <laughs> and this particular shark was very hungry. Um, we actually had 10 attacks on the AUV. Um, that particular video went viral, as you can imagine, um, and was uh, featured heavily in the film we made from this particular track. But what I loved about the Guadalupe expedition is we were able, and here you'll see the shark follow it saying, well, why didn't you die? <laughs> And I think it swears at it, too. You'll see it bark out some kind of a swear in a second as it takes off. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> you can only imagine what it said, right? Um, we had 10 attacks on the vehicle. We actually just published this, this particular paper, which is indirect evidence, or perhaps direct evidence, as you, depending on how you view it, of uh, subsurface predatory behavior by a white shark at 100 meters deep. And that had never been seen before. Most of what we see in terms of white shark feeding behavior is sharks pinning seals to the surface. And you've all seen that on television, I'm sure. But we never really get a chance to see what they're doing when they leave our, our site. And I think this is going to be a, a, a tool that can be used not only for white sharks, but a number of different species. We propose doing turtle work with it, with it as well as a lot of marine mammal work. And uh, we're building on it. We just got back from an expedition in December of 2015 and uh, I can't show you anything from that because it hasn't aired yet, but um, I can tell you that we went uh, well in excess of 12 hours on tracks to depths as great as uh, uh, six, 700 feet deep um, and during the night. So you first nighttime observations of white sharks swimming at 300 meters deep. Um, so uh, what's next for us with this? We're going to continue with the technology, expanding it. I am hoping that someday we will follow sharks to to areas that, uh, that they go to and see what they're actually doing. Um, other technology, and this is my last slide is, that we use this summer, is uh, critter cam type technology that records data at the same time observations by sharks. We clamped this to a dorsal fin on a free swimming shark off of Cape Cod, and we got the data back, we got the video back, and that's actually the shark following us. 
<laughs> as viewed from that camera system, um, which is a bit unnerving. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you guys. I know some of you have to run off to class. I'll stick around for a little bit if you have questions. If you want to stay around and ask questions, I'm, I'm here for you guys. But thanks for your time and uh, um, for being here. We have time for questions if you would like. Maybe this is, you can't tell us this, but have you, are there plans to go into the Pacific to look at the, calf, the Great White Shark Cafe to see well, whether it's for reproduction or? You know? Yeah, we've talked a lot about it. Um, the technology's not ready yet. The problem is, see, the, the Pacific would be the exact place to do it because those sharks are far more predictable than ours. The ones on the Atlantic, some wander around, some don't. Um, the Pacific, it's almost like clockwork. They stop feeding in November, December, and then they head off to the cafe. So it would be the right thing to do. The hard part is, you know, we won't have to be able to deploy it until we get on station, and then you've got to find that shark. And this is a massive area. Um, so being able to find the shark that has your transponder on it is going to be a bit difficult. But um, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there. It's a good question. I hope it happens while I'm alive. <laughs> Who knows about that? <laughs> Uh, so first of all, that's incredibly cool stuff. Oh, thank um, you. Especially, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but with the with the drones following the sharks, you're you're studying the behavior. Do you have a sense for whether the fact that the shark's being followed by the drone affects its behavior? Well, you know, people see the attack footage and they figure, well, the damn thing's getting followed by it. It's going to eat it. It turns out that none of our sharks being tracked actually attacked the vehicle. Those were other sharks which gives us a sense that we're not impacting it too much. Now, the one thing about the vehicle technology that I love is you can set almost any parameter relative to where you want that vehicle to be. And if you just want to track where the shark's going, and then um, you could stay back 50, 100 meters, and the shark won't even know you're there because it's, it's, it's not going to be seen by the shark. Um, but then you can also have, if the transponder does anything radical like accelerates or spins in circles, We'll, the vehicle will know that and will speed up to find out what happened. So let's say the, the shark, we're tracking the shark from 100 meters back. We don't want to impact its behavior. And then um, the shark attacks a seal. So it accelerates, it stops, it speeds in one spot. The vehicle will detect that because of the, the nature of the information coming back, pitch, roll, those kinds of things. And then it can speed up and see what happened. That's the way I'd like to do it. But because I'm not writing the checks, Discovery wants imagery, so we stay out right on those sharks pretty tight. Um, they don't, doesn't seem to bother them, but every now and then a shark will turn around, come back at the vehicle, and just brush it off. Uh, Andrew, do you want to go off and ask that question? Andrew, did you want to ask that question? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll ask for him. Uh, in, in general, is there a role for veterinarians in the white shark ecology slash conservation area? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, ab uh, absolutely. The, um, we work with veterinarians when we do our, uh, a lot of our stress physiology. Also, when we're handling animals, um, because we want to make sure that the care of the animal is taken into consideration, and no one knows how to do that better than veterinarians. So um, I did a lot of, like I said, I did a bunch of work with, uh, with Tufts the Veterinary School. Uh, as I was cutting my teeth, so to speak, on, on stress physiology. And, um, yeah, we, we work with vets uh, quite a bit. So I remember reading a number of papers over the years about uh, a tagged white shark from South Africa that moved all the way across the Atlantic and also uh, tuna that were going back and forth between North America and the Caribbean and, and uh, the Mediterranean. Do you think your populations of sharks or our population of sharks here are actually doing that kind of migration all the way across the Atlantic? Yeah, you, you, you reference a, uh, a paper by Ramon Bonefield where he tagged a white shark in South Africa and it went to Western Australia and then came back to South Africa. And um, it was the only shark he had that did that. And they've tagged a whole bunch since. Um, that have not. But 
Um, Lydia is a great example of a shark that just does an oddball thing, wandered out. Um, I don't know if the movements are as extensive as they go down into the South Atlantic. We've had no evidence of that. But, you know, and there is genetic structure, population structure between the oceans, as you would imagine. Um, and I think we're most closely related to uh, the Mediterranean population. Uh, but, you know, the bluefin tuna do it much more frequently than our white sharks. It's a, it's a great question. And of course, it's, it's wonderful because it's, uh, it's job security. It means I have to tag more, right? <laughs> so I have a quick question. Um, yes, sir. I'm really curious about this depth that Lydia was hanging out at. Is there an ideal temperature for sharks to minimize energy loss? Is, you know, so what, what is there, you know, if they're going to be sitting down low and then coming up to the surface, is there a temperature where they'd want to be hanging out? So there's a light penetration issue and perhaps a temperature physiology. Issue. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, I love the question because I don't know if there's an easy answer. I mean, Frank Carey's original track uh, showed that the, the shark really preferred to be in the thermocline, which is a great place to be because you can, you know, you modulate your temperature fairly easily in depth. Um, but what really complicates things with white sharks, as the case for all lamnids, which is makos, poor beagles, and whites, is they're, they're endothermic. They're, they're like the tunas. So they're a very unique group of animals that can elevate their body temperature above ambient. And so um, that complicates things. We know with ectothermic sharks, there seems to be a very specific temperature range that is preferred, so to speak. Um, in the case of white sharks, they seem to have a much broader temperature niche that they can inhabit, which allows them, I think, to penetrate uh, latitudinally and uh, depth-wise, vertically. So um, it's really hard to t So what we do is we take all those temperature data and we do a histogram and find that it's like a bell curve. So you can say, okay. But you, then we stratify by coastal sharks versus deep water sharks and that the whole thing kind of falls apart. But with the basking shark, which we found is doing very similar behavior, but instead of moving you know, east-west, it's moving north-south. Basking sharks are ectothermic. They can't elevate their body temperature. When they go to the Caribbean, which is what they do in the off months, um, which we only learned from satellite technology, they, inhabit, they go deep to inhabit the same temperature range they have when they're in temperate waters. Um, so th their temperature doesn't shift. It seems that white sharks can go wherever the heck they want. But there's trade-offs, you know, there's always debt, you know, and, and they've got to be gaining. So, so, so the big question, I'm always, I'm always, okay, what lives there? What lives at five, four, five, six hundred meters deep in, you know, at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you know? So I'm always walking around the offices of Woods Hole Oceanographic saying, what lives there? And they go, well, we've got these, these species and that species, massive biomass, da, da, da. But yeah, those are just like... There's all these data that have been collected, but no real density data. I mean, so you've got, there's a lot, there, there's a couple new papers that indicate that there's massive biomass in the meso mesopelagic zone, but they're all tiny little fishes, maybe some squid. So could this big charismatic shark that eats seals go out to the Atlantic and just gorge itself on schooling fishes, little tiny ones? Maybe. I'd love to know. Does the white shark uh, interact with other sharks, like the sand shark, uh, which used to get caught in all the gill nets? Is there, so that's a two-part question. One is yeah. shark interactions, and the other has to do with sharks' feeding behavior in relationship to the fishermen and gill nets? Problems, yeah. Um, because white sharks are now um, protected by state and federal government, but not protected as, in the, as defined by the ESA, but protected by the National Marine Fisheries Service, which means that you, you know, you can't target them, but if you kill one inadvertently, we're not going to throw the book at you because you are targeting dogfish, right? So we do have bycatch mortality that is occurring, but it's cryptic. We don't know what, how many white sharks are dying in, this, in the gill nets that are set off of Cape Cod in particular every summer targeting the smaller dogfish. And there's a big fleet doing that right now. And I know that some of them have targeted, uh, have not, have caught the white sharks, but they don't want to tell us because they don't want to ha have it in their possession. They don't, and if they tell me, I'm going to tell them to bring it in. And they don't want to handle a 5,000-pound animal, bring it to the dock, and then be, look like the guy who killed Shamu 
because they really love the white sharks now on Cape Cod, and you don't want to bring one in that's got a tag in it. And so the fishermen just cut them out and leave them be. But um, I do think the white sharks are eating those dogfish. We've done some pretty intensive stable isotope work, and it looks like most of the time they're feeding at a lower trophic level than what we think. We would expect to be, you know, cetaceans and pinnipeds, and they're not. The bulk of their diet seems still to be fish. Well, we should probably stop there, so thank you once again. And Thanks, guys. Thank you. I'll stick around. If you have questions, just come on up. <laughs>